Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, great to have you. Thank you so much for coming out to church today. I want to welcome everybody who's watching us online. Great to have you join us. And everybody that's in Isanti, thank you so much for coming out to church today at our Isanti campus. Uh, we are in the, kind of the middle of our series. It's called Weird, and it's really a weird title, I think, for a series. But uh, what we're really talking about is these things that are strange, especially religious things. And, and we all got to admit, if we're honest with ourselves, there's some religious practices, some Christian practices that kind of from the outside you look at it and it's like, that's really strange. That's, you know what? Sometimes you think normal people wouldn't do that, you know? But, uh, but there are some things that are religious that God has asked us to do. And it just look kind of weird from people who are kind of maybe outside or not. Maybe, maybe you don't think that you're you know, a very religious person, and maybe you don't do some of these practices, you just think that's hard to, to get a hold of. That's, that's just kind of hard to, like, I don't, I can't see myself ever doing that. Now, there are other things that are weird in life, and I think most of us, most of us do things in our life sometimes that other people would look at and say, well, that's weird. Now, it's not weird to you because you do it, but to other people, they might look at that and say, that's really strange, that's out there, I can't believe anybody would, would do that. Now, to illustrate that, how many of you here are bow hunters? Raise your hand if you're a bow hunter. Raise it proud. I, Sandy, raise your hand proud. Come on, you're a bow hunter. Okay, for the rest of you, this might appear a little weird, okay? Now, I personally, I, probably more than anything else of hobbies, I enjoy bow hunting, I love to do it, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit about how I do that. I normally don't start deer hunting until about the middle of October because it opens in September, but, you know, it's not kind of a waste of time until the middle of October. Bucks kind of start moving a little bit. And what I'll do is a month ahead of time, wash all my clothes and scent free stuff and uh, let it be outside for a while. But the particular, you know, like, like any, any day that I'm going to go hunting, usually this is what it looks like. Get up at, uh, you know, an hour and a half before dark, maybe 4.35 o'clock in the morning, take a shower, scent-free shampoo, scent-free soap, go get in my scent-free clothes, put on scent-free boots, okay, so totally scent-free, with a flashlight, walk out into the woods, and then climb up a tree 20 to 23 feet in the air, like to be about that high. Uh, I don't ever hunt in one stand more than two days in a row. Don't want my scent to be there. I don't want deer to know I'm going there, so I have several set up. And then, there I can sit there. Now imagine this. Imagine. It's, it's a half hour before the sun even cracks. It's a half hour before you can see the ground. It's so dark out. And there I'm sitting, 54-year-old guy, 20 feet in a tree, just sitting there. Some of you are thinking, that's really weird. Well, I think you're weird. How's that? Uh, <laughs> So there I sit, and, and when the sun starts to come up, I mean, just when it's just legal shooting, half hour before the sun comes up, I do a routine. It will sound, try to sound like two bucks fighting. You think that's funny? All the while being totally intense watching. I've been busted a couple times with doing this, and there's a buck staring right at me. Huh? <laughs> you don't want to do that. Set that aside and look for a couple minutes, listening and watching. And then I'll give him a little, I talk like the deer, a little buck grunt. Sorry. <laughs> I embarrassed myself. <clears throat> Watching, listening, waiting. Nothing happens. I try the female side, give a little doe bleat. <laughs> Don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> Set that aside and just wait. Meantime, 
weeks earlier, I've set up a little thing in a tree close to me. It's called a dripper. And it's filled with, you'll never guess, deer pee. <laughs> and let that sit out there and gets the scent in the area of deer pee. But if that's not enough, I always put a little deer pee on myself, too. <laughs> and then, because deer are so wary, they can smell anything. Throughout the day, I'll check the wind, see which direction the breeze is blowing, because I don't want to call any deer from downwind. They'll smell you. And they'll wait. Some people say they talk to God when they're hunting. I don't. I can't connect with God. I'm too busy. I'm focused. Every 30 minutes, the routine starts again. Who can get bored? Right? Now, now so, some of you are looking at that like, okay, here's, a, here's like an old man sitting 20 feet in a tree playing games with these deer. Like, that's kind of crazy, right? You're thinking, you're thinking that that's really, as a matter of fact, our, our phrase for this series, you would think, that's really weird. That is weird. And I know to most of you it is, but I am telling you it is necessary. Because even though anyone can shoot a deer, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, my Uncle John went out there, he had a hangover, and he went out and smoked a cigar and shot a monster buck. I know your Uncle John can do that. But, hey, to do it consistently, it is necessary to do some of these things. So I just want to brag for a minute and show you what success looks like. If you haven't been to my house, this is what it looks like. Now, I'm telling you that to do it consistently, to be, to be really successful or effective at, at harvesting white-tailed deer with a bow, this stuff is necessary. you got to do things that other people might think is a little bit weird or a little bit strange or like, hey, I can't believe you do that. Hey, it's necessary to do some of these things that look weird if you want to be successful. And I just want some of you guys that raised your hands when you, were bow, when you said you were a bow hunter, I mean, just watch and weep, man. Just weep. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, he's good. That's what you're thinking. Hey, here's the point. Even though some things look a little bit weird, but it's so necessary to do things to be effective, it's so true spiritually. It is so, it's so true. It's the same thing that even though there are some Christian things or some religious things that look a little bit weird, they are extremely necessary for our lives to be successful, to do what God wants us to do, for our lives to be effective spiritually we need to do some of these things. And today, what I want to talk to you about is probably, I mean, it's right up there with, with some of the weirdest things that there is in, in religion, some of the weirdest things that there is in Christianity. And what I want to talk to you about today, I'll be really honest with you, some of you, I, I just know this right off the start, some of you are going to push back. Some of you, and, and maybe, maybe some of you, I'll tell you what, you're, you might think, you know what, I'm never going there, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not going to do that, that's too weird, I don't understand it, and as a matter of fact, not only are some of you going to push back, but what I'm going to talk to you about today has caused some people just, it's just so hard for us to accept this, that it has caused some people to just walk away from church completely, and as a matter of fact, it's caused some people, I believe, to just walk away from, from being spiritual at all, walked away from Christianity. Because what I'm going to talk to you about today is so unnatural. It is not what we normally would do. It is not a natural thing. As a matter of fact, it is so countercultural that, that what I'm going to talk about today, God's asked us to do, but it is so against our culture, it is so against our natural things that we do, no, that we would not do it normally. Our culture teaches us not to do this. It's, it's just something that just seems so opposite of of what would be good for us. And I think that some of us are just going to have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, I know you are. But, but, but here's the thing. If you're, if you're a religious person, if you believe in God, if you're a Christian person, God is not ashamed to ask us to do things sometimes that are countercultural. That the Bible says that God's ways aren't our ways. And as a matter of fact, this Bible verse right here, uh, found in Romans, tells us exactly this. It says, therefore... 
because of God's incredible love for us and what he's, what he's done for us. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy and love to us, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And it goes on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, God is not ashamed to say, if you believe in me, if, you, if, if you're connected to me, if you're a Christ follower, if you are a Christian person, he is not ashamed to say, I don't want you to be like everybody else. I don't want your life to, to be just like nature. I don't want you to do what's just natural all the time. His ways are different than our ways or, or what we say. And God's not ashamed to say, I want you to be, I don't want you to conform, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, and, his good pleasing, and perfect will for our lives. God is not ashamed. He is not afraid to ask us to do things that just seem a little bit out there, that, that are a little strange to people who are not religious at all or, or, don't, or don't connect with God at all. He's not ashamed to ask us that. And that, that topic, what I'm going to talk to you about today is this. It's, it's very simple. But God has asked us to be generous with our time and with our money. I know it's not normal. I, I know that we resist it, especially with those two things. God has asked all those who believe in him to be generous people with their time and with their money, especially towards his work, towards the church, and towards what God wants to do in this world. And he has asked all believers to be generous. And here's the problem with being generous. It's not the way we're taught. It's, it's against our culture. We live in probably one of the most self-centered, selfish cultures of all time. And, and we just can't help that we're surrounded by that. And it affects us. And it's kind of like how we naturally feel, especially when it comes to our time and our money. It's ours. It's precious. We spend so many hours a day working or hours a week working that any extra time is ours. It's, it's ours and we value that. Matter of fact, most of us, we, we spend all week working just so we can have our time on the weekend and our money. I mean, what's more, what's more important to life than our money? It's our money. We work hard for our money. We're not going to just give it away. We're not going to just, you know, let somebody have it and not get something in return. That's our culture. That's our human nature is to not be generous. Yeah, I get that. And that, that's why it's so hard. That's why we push against it. But at the same time, God has asked us to do something that is not culturally relevant. It's, it's just different. It's weird as far as culture goes, as far as our human nature goes. It's out there. But God has asked us to do that, especially for his church and his work. And I'll tell you why, and the Bible describes it so well. The Apostle Paul is writing to a pastor in the Bible of a church, He's instructing the church people, everybody, how to behave. He says, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the church, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And what God is asking all believers to do is to be generous with their time and, and their money for the church because there is no institution more important in our culture than the church. The church is the pillar and foundation of truth in our world, in our lives. It is necessary for, for civilization. It is necessary for a culture to have a foundation of truth guidelines, borders for how we behave and, and what we do and how we treat each other and what our values are. He said there is no organization that God has designed the church as the pillar and the foundation of truth in our world. I, re I remember when I was younger, much younger, I remember thinking, was that funny, Ryan? <laughs> when I was young. I remember when I was younger, I, I knew this, and I, I'd heard this, that, you know, God wants his followers to, 
you know, be involved and just give their time and give their money and stuff. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I, what I thought. And, and many of you might feel the same way. I felt like, well, even though I'm glad the church is there and I'm glad the church does its thing, you know, it doesn't really affect my life. I don't need to get involved. I don't need to give because I'm fine. I believe in God. I'm a Christian. And I can live my life as a Christian. And my family, I can tell them about God. The church doesn't really affect my life. It's just out there. It's the church. It's on the street corner. You know, other people do that. But I don't have to because it doesn't affect my life. Unfortunately, too many people have thought the same way. That, you know, the, the church is just something else. It's just something out there. And it doesn't really affect my life. And many of you might think, I, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. You know, I can live my Christian life by myself and live a good life. The church as an organization doesn't really affect me. I just want to challenge you and see if that's really true. Because we know that today in America, I've quoted this so many times, that only 20% of Americans actually attend church. 20%. Only 2 out of 10. 330 churches a month are closing their doors in America. The church is going away. But with it, so goes God's influence in our world. God's influence in this world is going away. And sometimes we think that that doesn't affect us. Well, it doesn't affect me and my home. I wonder if that's true. Because as the church goes away and as the godly influence in our culture goes away, the effects of godly teaching goes away. And the effects on culture go away. We, as a church, and you guys have seen, you know, nativity scenes in public and things like that. We, we've all seen that there's an attack on God in our country because there's less people who care. And therefore, God's getting kicked out. And, and we, we all know that. We don't, I don't need to prove that to you. But an interesting thing, we always, sometimes, not always, sometimes we think, well, that affects somebody else somewhere else. Really? Or does it affect our lives? The church, we as Access Church, Cub Foods called us and asked if we wanted to put an ad in um, their stores. What they have is where you do a checkout on the checkout counter. At the end of the counter, you can pay for having a paid ad there, and then people can just take a card home with them if they want. It costs, you know, it costs about 1200 bucks to do that, and they asked the church if we wanted to do that, and um, Shaheen made up a, a flyer for there and gave it to them as a sample. And here's what they, they called us back and said, well, I'm sorry, you guys will not, you know, you're not be able to do this because you have God in your literature. Here's what, here's what the God said. It said this, discover that God isn't distant. And that's offensive because apparently God is very offensive in our culture. Well, how did that happen? Well, the church and the church influence and guidance is going away. So does it affect our lives? I, I, I wonder, who else is going to teach our, our population the things that only the Bible teaches? What, what other organization is teaching personal responsibility and holding people to it? See, God's called the church to teach personal responsibility. Now, your family might be okay, but because other families aren't teaching personal responsibility, will that affect your life? Does that affect your life? You know, the Bible teaches that parents are personally responsible for raising their children in a good way, so that they'd be at, you know, a help to society, that they would function, take care of themselves, be responsible. But now that the, the church doesn't have the influence it used to, now we're asking our education system and our public schools to raise our children and teach them morality and things. And Do you think that's affecting you personally? Doesn't it affect you personally? As the church goes, does it affect our personal lives? 
We can't, our culture, we can't build prisons fast enough. We, we can't, we, the money it takes to house criminals and prisoners is going up exponentially. The church is the pillar and foundation of truth that a culture needs as a culture, as a society. I just heard just two days ago on the news, first time, for the first time in our history, that people are getting out of law enforcement, that we have less people wanting to go into law enforcement now because it's too dangerous, because people are just shooting cops just to shoot a cop, that people are getting out of it. Do you think that the church doesn't affect you personally and affect your personal life? What about morality in our country? Well, it doesn't affect me. I just keep my family away from the world. Really? How far can we run? I just think of some of the, the sexual stuff that's going on in our country. Who's to hold it back? Who's to stand there and teach morality from God's point of view? Because as the church loses and God loses influence in our, in our nation, it affects all of us. Maybe some of you had heard, I just got a story here, some of you might have heard this story on the news or just a news blip about it, that Planet Fitness uh, took away a woman's membership because a transgender uh, a male who thought that he was female was in the sh same locker room as her, and she was offended that he was male by all his genitalia, but he felt he was female, and she, got, she complained about it. Well, she's the one that was asked. Her membership was taken away. And I'll read to you the official stance from Planet Hollywood. This is their official thing. Planet Fitness, or Planet Fitness. Did I say Planet Hollywood? I meant Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness Director of Public Relations, McCall Gosselin, said the gym is, and I, and I quote, committed to creating a non-intimidating, welcoming environment for our members. Our gender identity non-description policy states that members and guests may use all gym facilities based on their, uh, their sincere, self-reported gender identity. In other words, their official stance is this, that if you feel like you're a male, no matter what your genitalia is, no matter what you are, then you can help yourself to all the male-appropriate things. If you feel you're female, you can help your self to all the female things. The local church is the pillar and foundation of truth. And as the church disappears, so God's influence disappears. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm just not going to join Planet Fitness. It seems like that's the thing to do. We, we as a culture have ran away from things that are going downhill. We just stay away from it. So don't join Planet Fitness. I have an article here from uh, the Maine Supreme Court. The state of Maine, listen to this. The Supreme Court of the state of Maine has, it has issued an opinion declaring that transgender children in the state's public schools must be allowed to choose their own bathrooms despite their genitalia or how uncomfortable other students may feel. That is statewide. Here, well, don't move to Maine. Doesn't affect me. The church going away doesn't affect my life. I just won't live in Maine. The Minnesota State High School League, which most of you are probably familiar with, uh, just adopted a plan, a gender uh, plan, that if a high school student feels like they're female, even though they have male genitalia, they can join female uh, activities and female stuff. That's right. That's in Minnesota. If a student feels like they're male, even though they're actually female, they can do that. Uh, but here's alarming. Well, don't live in Minnesota then. There are 33 other states that have already adopted a transgender policy just like that. And we wonder if um, it doesn't affect us. 
the church going away doesn't really affect me. It doesn't affect my life. I'm a Christian and I'm fine. I don't care where the church goes. Is that true? It really doesn't affect our lives. I mean, look what's happening all around us. The church of Jesus Christ is definitely losing ground. But God has a plan. This is not God's way. God has a plan. As a matter of fact, God said that that even the gates of hell cannot stand against his church, that the church will grow and build. But God has a plan of how that happens. Listen to what the Bible says. He says that this is God's plan, okay? This is what God did. So Christ himself gave to the church, to the organization. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why did God give these to to the church? To equip his people for works of service. So that all of his people, if you call yourself a Christian, that there are people that God has placed, that God has called into ministry to teach and train everybody to be involved in works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up. So that the body of Christ may be built up in our cities, in our nation, in our country. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge. It goes on. Oh, in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, that's each one of us, grows and builds itself up in love. And here's the key. As each part does its work, as each part does its work, the kingdom of God grows. That that morality, the pillar and foundation of truth is successful, that the, that the pillar and foundation of truth affects our neighbors and our, our, our co-workers and our family members and it affects everybody around us and it has a difference and it makes a difference as each part does their work. That this is God's plan. God's plan is that everyone be generous with their time. That everyone fits in somewhere. That everyone can do something to further the kingdom of God. To help teach and train people. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not the staff's job. It's all of us. God's plan is that his people be generous with their time. To dedicate a portion of their time to help serve. I just was so blessed here at the North Branch campus yesterday when so many of you came out to, to, uh, to give out food. I mean, that was just absolutely amazing. As if I, I, just, I just stood here and just watched. I thought, man, there are so many. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of you just helping people and giving out food. It was just amazing. And like, I just thought, that's how God's church is supposed to be, where everyone does something. It was just amazing, amazing to see. But not just with our time, with our money as well. And, and I know, and, I, and listen, I know it's weird. I get it. I, I understand. People have left the church. I understand. There's this, there's this thing of it's my money. I get all of that. But this is what God has asked us to do. Financially, he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. You see, in the Old Testament, God required people to give 10%. If they did not give 10%, call the tithe, that they would be cursed from God because God says, I've given you everything. I require 10% back. You can keep 90. New Testament, he doesn't require. There's no, there's no punishment on us. There's no, you know, the, this plague will happen if we don't give. The New Testament's totally different. Since Jesus came, he wants it to come from our heart. But he wants us to be generous. And he says, I want you each to give, every single person to give. But I want you to do what's in your heart. I don't want you to do it reluctantly. Listen, it, it hurts me when people, you know, oh, they're going to talk about money again, you know, kind of thing like that. Listen, if you don't want to give, don't. You know, that's just between you and God. doesn't mean you have to leave God's work. doesn't mean you have to leave the church. God wants you to do it, not reluctantly at all, or under compulsion. He doesn't want some tricky message to get you all worked up. He wants you to think of it. He wants you to want to give. And here's the reason why. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves when his people, when Christian people, 
Say, I understand that the work of God, the church, is the pillar and foundation of truth in our culture. And even though I might feel fine and I feel like, well, it doesn't affect me if the church goes away, but I want other people to be affected. I want the church to grow and have an influence in our culture. Because my kids are going to grow up in the same culture as those other kids. It does affect me. I want to be a part of it. With all that said, i got to just share something with you. How much time do I have? Um, We as a church... We, as a church, are doing very well compared to most. Uh, I am familiar with all the other churches in the areas. Uh, there aren't any churches doing well. We all know attendance. I mean, it's, it's a statistic. Churches are going downhill. This church has done very, very well. However, we have financially been under a burden for years. We have financially been struggling. We've been able to do things. It's great. But financially, we've been struggling, and it seems like you know, giving keeps going down even though more people are coming. And, and uh, because of that, last week we had to make some tough choices as a church. We had to lay off a couple of our staff members. And every staff member took a cut in pay. And uh, it's, we, we took some drastic measures because the work of the church has to continue. Now, we're still going to have weekend services. We're still going to have stuff. But, but here, here's where it comes down to this, this has nothing to do with our staff personally. It has nothing to do with, I can go get another job. That, it's not about that. I don't want you to feel bad for our staff people. They all are talented. They can go get other jobs. That's not the problem. And this building, it's not about this building. This building can turn into a fitness center. It's fine. The building will still be here. This can be a fitness center or a Harley Davidson shop. That's not the issue. The issue is... The work of the church and the kingdom of God, will it go on? It's dying all over in our world, in our country. Will it go on here? I want to read you a couple of statistics. I just, and I'm, I'm closing, but I want to read you a couple of statistics here. It's just amazing. Um, especially for a lot of you in Isanti, you probably, have, you know, you're new to the church, you didn't know this. We've been, Access Church has been around for 15 years. In the last 15 years, 1,570 people have put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ for the first time. That is absolutely amazing. That is over 100 people per year. That is amazing. The average church in America is one person per church per year. Amazing. 685 people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. 431 people have been baptized in water as an adults. Our recent survey that we took last month, 88% of you that are, that are coming here say that coming to Access Church has helped you grow spiritually. That this place being here is affecting your family, affecting your life. Listen to this statistic. I just think this is the greatest. 42% of the people now attending Access Church in either location did not attend a church before coming here. That is absolutely amazing. That is what the church of Jesus Christ is all about, reaching out to people. What an amazing success. Um, This whole idea of, does the church affect me? Absolutely. It affects every single one of us. And the work of the church must go on. Some people ask, well, if we, if we knew we were kind of struggling financially, why did we start Isani Church? And two, two things, really quickly. One is, Isanti is not a burden because we didn't borrow any money. There's no overhead. We paid for everything that's over there. And now there's a full-functioning church in a different community because of that. So it's not a financial burden. The money that we spent over there wouldn't have changed our financial situation here, really. So um, we did that. But listen to this. I just want to read you one story from Isani. Some of you guys on Isani might know these people. I don't. It says this. Somebody just wrote in and said, I started coming to church in Isani shortly after you started up. I can't thank you enough for bringing your ministry to Isani. I was a very lost soul. Felt drawn into the church. And there you were. Finally, I felt that I made a good choice in my life for myself. Your church makes everyone fit in. Thank you so much. My empty heart 
has found a place that can inflate that deflated place. I found a place to belong. Thank God that my Santi is there. Um, praise God. Uh, just a, a letter that came in here. Sunday services that we go to uh, here in North Branch are the best that we've ever been involved with. The music is fantastic. It moves the spirit. Along with that, the messages are strong, Bible-based. Life-learning topics that are easy to relate to anything going on in our lives. Praise God for that. I wanna, I'm just going to read one more. Um, th- this one, every time I see this guy, it's just that he blesses me. But he, he just wrote into the church to say this. Access Church has given me everything that I've ever needed, especially during a very tragic time in my life with the loss of my beloved son. He had a 14-year-old son that was killed. He said, I did not not know where to turn or what to do. My church friends and the pastors helped me. I felt so blessed knowing that I had so many fellow Christians by my side, and they are all still here for me to this day. I am thankful every time that I enter this church, whether it is to attend Sunday services or Wednesday night Bible study. I don't know how my life would be today without my church and church family. Here's the the bottom line is this. I know it's a little weird, especially in our culture, to be generous with our time and with our money. But the idea that I used to have that the church really doesn't affect my life I'll be fine without it, isn't really true. Because even though to this point, maybe you've been able to change schools, maybe you don't live in Maine, but how much longer can we run away from these things in culture and still be fine? When will it be that your children are showering with somebody of the opposite sex? When will it be? You know, when, when will it be that you are so unsafe in your own home When will it's, we can't run forever. And to think that the local church doesn't affect us personally is just simply not true. And for the local church, for this church, to continue to do what it does, to continue to reach people and to draw people and and to allow people to experience the amazing love that God has for them, God's plan says, I want all of you to be generous with your time, and with your money. I'm going to hand it now over to Shaheen to close the service in Isanti. And we're going to end with just talking to God. Father, this is up to each one of us. You do not force us to do anything. It's just not your character. We all have a free will. But I pray, Father, that every one of us who... Now, if we're, if we're not a Christian, that's fine. But for every one of us who believe in you and are Christians... I pray, God, that we would see that even though we may not be very involved in church, I pray that we would never think again that the church doesn't affect my life. If the church fails in America, my life will never have peace in it. We will live in in complete chaos. The church is the pillar and foundation that holds our culture together. I pray that each one of us here would be a supporter of that in your name. Thank you, Father. Amen.